name is Marie Dacke, and I think my presentation will come up very soon. I am, as you heard, not, and you will hear as well when I speak, I'm not from South Africa, so thank you all for hosting me in your beautiful country. I'm here for a four and a half month sabbatical, and for the first time I've moved my whole family here for four and a half months. My youngest son wants to move here. We are very, very thrilled about Johannesburg. There's never a boring day. Not today either. So I originally, the other time I work in Lund, uh, Lund University in the southern part of Sweden in the vision group. So as you can guess, my main research area is about vision. And I've looked at vision in humans, yes, but mostly I look at visual capabilities in much smaller animals. And as a researcher, we all, all researchers, want to change the world. And I was thinking I would start a bit with my audience here tonight and see if I can change you. Much of my talk will be focused around some small animals, and it will be about insects. So I would like to start, before I start talking, I would like you in the audience to take about two minutes, think about the first five things that comes to you when I say the word insect. And don't limit yourselves to bees or flies. Think about mosquitoes and all sorts of things. Do you find them irritating, annoying, beautiful, or whatever? Think about five things. Try to remember them. Tell your neighbor. Make them remember what you think about the insects. So five things. Write them in your phones. Tell your neighbor. Whatever. You have two minutes. So five things that comes to mind when I say insects. Okay, that's all the time you get. It should be the first things that come to your mind. So I hope you are finished and will remember. So I will start by comparing what insects can do compared to what we as humans can do. And being a vision researcher, I will of course focus on vision. This here is a picture from something called the color run that we have in Lund, and I'm I'm pretty sure you have it here in Johannesburg as well, where they throw colored powder on each other. This is the way we see the color run. We see it in color, because we have color vision. We have three different pigments in our eyes, <coughs> and they are the ones that make it possible for us to see the colors that we see. If we take away one pigment, we end up with a colorblind person. The picture to your right is the way a colorblind person will see the world. And about 5% of all men are colorblind, so I'm fairly convinced there are some men in the audience that can't really see the difference between these two photographs. So what happens when you lose a color pigment in your eye is that you will see fewer shades of color. And it's not only colorblind people that see the world like this, it's also many mammals that see the world like this. Cows will see the world like this. So will your cats, your guinea pigs, rabbits, and also your dogs. And as you see, a colorblind person or a dog can't see the difference between green and red, which is one of the many reasons why a dog should not be driving a car, because you can't see the difference between the green and the red on the traffic lights. So here we have taken away one pigment, you see how, less, how many colors we lose by doing that. So where do we place the insects in this picture? Well, we actually have to go to the other side. 
Because many insects, they have three pigments, but many more insects also have four pigments, or the butterfly that you see here have five different color pigments. I can't show you what their world looks like because our visual system is not able to perceive the world as seen through the eye of this butterfly. But you can just imagine that where we see only the colors that you see on the right, the butterfly will see many more different shades of colors. And this is, of course, helpful if you're flying around in the garden looking for flowers, the exact right type of flowers, and also how to find the center of the flower. So here, the insects actually outmaster us in this task. If we look at the color run again, we will also Notice, of course, that people are running. And you also measure visual performance in how fast we can see. One way of measuring that is to let a lamp flash. And if we turn this lamp on and off 60 times per second, that's the limit that we can see it flashing. If it flashes 70 times per second, we perceive this as a constant light. We don't see the flashes. This is what we call 60 hertz, because it goes on and off 60 times per second. Many animals have slower vision, as for example the turtle. They can only see the light as going on and off if it flashes 15 times per second. So if I move my hand like this, a turtle will not be able to see my hand, because their vision is much slower than ours. Again, where do we place the insects? Well, again, we have to go to the other side of the spectra. Because most insects, they see many times faster than we do. Here, they see up to 200 hertz, and we stop at 60 hertz. This means that when we have the older type of cinemas, if a fly was in the cinema, they would see the film as a slideshow because they would see all the individual bits of the film, because the vision is so much faster. This also has consequences in everyday life for us. This is why it's so hard to kill a fly with your hand. Because you might be thinking you move your hand quickly, but not to the fly. They will see your hand coming miles away, moving towards it, and they're also very fast in responding which is why it's very difficult to kill the fly. So insects are also much faster in the way they see the world. So insects in general can do the most fantastic things. Some of the animals we're working on are these. These are the orchid bees found on Bella Colorado Island in Central America. The bees are here, if you look at them, they are putting their front legs on the tree and they're doing that to collect scent. We have put eucalypt oil on the tree, and the bees will arrive to collect the scent. Once they have collected it, if you look very carefully, you will see that they take the front legs, put it in their back legs, because this is where they have pockets to create perfume. These are all male bees that come here, and they use the perfume to attract the females. The more complicated the perfume is, the more attractive is the male. Because it means they have been able to fly over much larger distances to collect the different scents for their perfume. And since we are in Central America, there are no eucalypts there. So this would indicate that they have flown a very long way away. But if you look at this, insects can fly to start with, which is a very, very hard skill to master. You have to adapt your speed, you have to adapt your position so you don't crash into the trees. And on top of that, these male bees, they know how to compose perfume. They know how to add scent, to move scent, and they know how to get a woman as well which are fairly complex things, all of these, that these insects actually master. And this is really fascinating that they can do this, because when we look at ourselves, if I look at your brain or my brain, it contains some 86 billion nerve cells. 
It is so many, so it's kind of hard to understand how many nerve cells you actually carry around each day. But if you were to count them one by one, one per second, we would have to be many people counting your nerve cells because it would take us 2,700 years to count all of them. That's how many you have stored in your brain. But if we take an average insect, they will have around 100,000 neurons, and I could count that on myself. It would take me about 27 hours. So we have a huge difference in the computers we carry around with us to solve the things we have to solve on a daily basis. There's a huge difference between a 27-hour computer and a 2,700-year computer. And still, we see the insects performing these highly complex, complex tasks. And one of the things that I want to do in my research is to understand how is this possible. And one way that I would like to demonstrate this to you, we'll test it in here and see if it works. How many in here have seen this film before? Okay, I'm obviously not in Northern Europe, because then about 50% would have seen it. Good. Uh, this is two basket teams. One is dressed in white and one is dressed in black. I want you to count how many times the people dressed in white pass the ball between them. It's a bit dark here, so you will have to concentrate really hard on this task. And to make it more difficult, there is also a ball in the black team. Don't worry about that one. Your task is to count how many times the players in white pass the ball between them. Okay? Do it silently so we can all test our brains, okay? Okay, how many counted to 12? 12? Some of you. 13? 14? Most of you didn't count at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the answer is 13. So well done, all of you who did this. But this was not really the task, obviously. That would be a bit too easy. I wanted to know how many of you in the audience saw a, a dancing bear. <laughs> one there and one there. Okay. The ones that... The the ones that didn't see the bear didn't do this because you're able to concentrate really well. <laughs> the ones of you that saw the bear, slightly worse at the task, maybe. And I'm going to play the movie again. So now just don't worry about the basketball players. <coughs> Here comes the bear. I mean, it is a bit dark, but you can see him moving sideways there. 90% of all people will miss the bear because you are told to watch the white players what they are doing. So what our brains then do is that we concentrate on white things and we ignore everything that is black. This is also why when the police come to a traffic situation and someone has been hit by a car, they say, what color was the car that hit the person? And most people go, ha. I don't know. Because we did not focus on the color of the car. We looked at the person being hit, trying to solve the situation. So we filter out information all the time. And this is what insects do to the extreme. They get rid of all information that is not important in order to be able to only focus on the important things. And this you have to do to solve the world using a 27-hour brain. This is uh, not the picture for my garden. I wish it was, but it's not. But this is often where we find the insects we are working on. I mostly work on bees, and they will fly through the garden. If you look at the garden, it's a very complex place. It's full of colors. It's full of um, moving things, it's full of different objects, there will be other insects, lots of flowers and so on. How is an insect able to fly safely in this complicated environment? 
Well, they do so using something that is called optic flow. This is, the, this is a good scientific term to know if you ever want to discuss how an insect flies, optic flow. So when I move forward in the environment, the whole world moves backwards in a flow created by my own movement. If I move quickly, the world will move quickly. If things are close to me, like the traffic lights, they will move across my eye much faster than a mountain that is very distant from me. So things that move quickly are close to me. Things that move slowly are much further away from me. And this is something that we investigate in the lab. And uh, the model animals we use are the bumblebees that unfortunately you cannot study here. But it's very easy for us to do it. We basically order them in the mail. <laughs> we get a buzzing box of uh, bumblebees because they're used in greenhouses. So it's very easy to get them there. They also know where to put them when we get them. It's like... <laughs> and that yellow box there that you see are the bumblebees. We then train them to fly into a tunnel, the black and white thing you see, in onto a sugar feeder where they get fed. That's the blue bit here. Insects love blue. So if you want to attract insects to your garden, use blue and yellow things. And we can then control exactly what they see in this tunnel, and then we film them using a high-speed camera. Because if you remember, their world is resolved very, very highly in the, in the domain of movement. So we have to film them at the speed that they see the world. <coughs> and we can then use tunnels of different widths. Here is a PhD student that specializes in using big tunnels. <coughs> so what can we then see from these experiments? Well, the tunnel you see on top is full of black and white patterns. So when the insect flies through it, it will create a lot of movement over the eye. And then the animal can just adjust the speed of the movement to a given speed and fly at that speed. Whereas in the tunnel at the bottom, there are only horizontal stripes. If you move and there are horizontal stripes, nothing will actually change over your eye. So the insect has got nothing to control its speed against. This is what you see. The little black dots you see are the bumblebees flying. And you will fairly quickly see that the bee on the bottom flies three times faster than the bee at the top. This is too fast for this tunnel and they will sometimes crash into the wall walls. Whereas the tunnel, at the, whereas the bee at the top is flying at a very good speed for the environment it's flying through, regulating it using the optic flow pattern. If we put them in a tunnel like this, what the insects also do is that they try to keep the speed of the optic flow pattern the same on both sides of its eye. That means it's equally far away from that side as from that side, safest point to fly, because it doesn't want to collide with the walls. In the, in the further part, in the, in the end part of the tunnel, we have again put the horizontal stripes. So it doesn't feel itself moving, so it doesn't see any obstacles, and it interprets that as open space. And will then move over to that side to move away from the wall, not to collide with it. And this is what that looks like theoretically, and this is what it looks like when we let a bumblebee fly. You see, it diverts over to that side because it interprets that as not being there at all. So then, what does a bumblebee do in your garden? Will it use the tulips for its optic flow flight control system? Yes, it will, but in a different sense that maybe you think. We have tested this by building a tulip tunnel of our own, letting the bee, uh, the, the, the bee fly down it. And then we look at, uh, we change the patterns they see, and then we try to understand what they're actually looking at. So if this is a view that we would have of the tulips, we know that the insects don't care about the color for their flight control system. It could be black and white. They actually don't care at all. They don't carry any information about what they're looking at. It could just as well be a number of ostriches standing there <laughs> as tulips. They don't care about the details of the ostriches. 
And really, they don't care if it's obstacles or anything else out there. All they look for are differences in dark and bright. And that is what they register moving over their eyes. So this is basically what the garden is turned into for a flight control system of a bee. Uh, other bees um, don't necessarily fly in a garden. This is again a tropical bee from Central America. This is a nocturnal bee that has a totally different problem in its world, and that is trying to negotiate the world when it's dark. They will fly very quickly, so we'll move over to a slow down version. Every night after sunset and before sunrise, these bees are out flying. They fly for kilometers, and then they have to return to their own little nest in the rainforest. A forest is full of sticks, but it has to find its own little stick, and it's so dark that if I throw the stick on the ground, I will not be able to find the same stick again. Even so, this little animal is able to find its way back, find its nest stick, and crawl in again to feed its larvae that it keeps in its nest. And we wanted to know if they can use vision to control their flight as well. So we have just placed the same setup, but now out in the forest instead, and looked at what happens with the bees. And I'm just going to show you what happens when we place them in a tunnel with horizontal stripes when they can no longer control their flight. This is what we see. Here comes the bee, and it's sadly enough crashing into every possible surface of this tunnel because everything they use to control their flight is vision. Otherwise, they would surely have used it in this situation. So eyes on these tiny animals can still be used when it's very, very dark. And there are a number of neuronal specializations to make this happen. And these bees here have been the, the inspiration of, uh, uh, for cars that are supposed to see themselves at night, not to drive into other people, and the inspiration has been taken from these bees. This is some beautiful piece of research done by other researchers in my lab. So, there are, we are constantly designing different types of robots, different kinds of, of electrical devices, and using insects as inspiration is used worldwide. And this is mostly because they can do these amazing tasks with a, with a very little brain power. Because when we design robots, we often want them to be small and lightweight and cheap. And thereby, we don't want to equip them with a big and heavy brain. And where is it better then to go to for inspiration than to the insects that have already solved the problem of looking at very complex things in a very simplified manner? This is also why many of the robots that have been designed sort of resemble the insects as well. So, I'm now, you don't have to answer this, but just think about it. Do you think you maybe want to reconsider your view of insects so far? But if you don't think so yet, <laughs> I'll give you many more points to why you maybe want to do this. The reason why I'm here, and I have kept on returning to South Africa for maybe around the last 20 years or so, is to work with the South African dung beetles together with my colleague Marcus Byrne, that is also here tonight and was here on stage a while ago, and is the reason why I am here today, I would think, I would say. That is to work with these beetles. We don't study flight control in them. Mostly because they're not very good flyers all the time. We often find them sitting on the barbed wire where they have themselves been very successful in flying into the barbed wire. But also because beetles are really difficult to deal with. You can't really make them fly when we want to and so on. But we look at them more for their navigational abilities. So one really large interest is to understand how animals are able to navigate the world using no other equipment than themselves. So we find a dung pile, we can just wait there, and then the insects themselves will show up because this is their favorite dinner. 
Once they have found the dung pile, they dig into it and they start forming a ball, a little lunch bag, however you, you want to look at it. And then they start to roll it away from the dung pile. And other beetles will, of course, still be flying into the dung pile. And they are warm because they've just flown. If you're warm as an insect, you're also very fast. So you're very likely to win a fight with someone else that has already made a ball. So they will often have a go to try to steal it. Here it's one of our experimental animals, number F3, we marked on with Tipex, <laughs> that is trying to steal a beetle from a, wi from a ball from a wild beetle. And these fights, as you see, they are fairly energetic. Yeah. <laughs> and they, it's not good for the owner of the ball to have to do this. It costs energy, they will be warm in the sun, they can be eaten by something, of course, if they stay out here for too long. And ultimately, they want to keep their ball. It looks like it got to keep its ball. No, because F3 attacked again and eventually actually got the ball. So it's, it's risky business. But if we look at this from above instead, if you imagine here that the black circle in the middle is a dung pile, we let the beetles in and we see them rolling out from the dung pile in very straight lines. And this is what the dung beetles are so unique in. It's their ability to you just give them a ball and they will want to roll it in a straight line. Why do they want to do this? Well, if we imagine this is the dung pile, this is, um, this is the place where they don't want to be. This is where all the shit happens. And that is the place they want to get away from. And the most efficient way of doing that is to move straight. Because if you move straight, you know you will never ever come back to there again. And you also get away with every single footstep. The problem they face, however, is that no animal can move straight without the compass. We can't move straight without the compass either. And we just decided to test this one day. Sometimes we work at a private school here in Johannesburg. This is on the, is on the land hockey pitch. And uh, we have a GPS system that we track the beetles with. But now this is in the middle of the day. It was so warm that the dung ball started to melt into the, into the hockey pitch. And um, we thought that was kind of not so nice to the school. So we decided to stop the experiments for a little while. And instead, we decided to test ourselves. Can we move backwards as a dung beetle? The guy you see here, he's got Iron Maiden playing in the headphones. He can't hear anything. And then we put the cap over his head, and I'm tracking him. And this is now sped up. I don't have a hip problem normally. And if you look, he was just told to walk straight backwards to that goal you see us passing by there. And he's not doing the task very well. But look at his reaction. He was 100% sure he was moving straight. In reality, this is what he did. He never got away from the dung pile, so to say. Then we swapped positions, and I was actually even worse. People would have stolen my time, my food, over and over and over again, because I was hopelessly lost in this situation. And this is because I wasn't carrying a compass. So where do the beetles carry their compass? That is the question we have been looking at for the last 20 years. We are fairly sure now where they do have it, though. One way of looking at this is to do the same thing with the beetles. We can put a cap on the beetles. They don't need Iron Maiden because the beetles don't have ears. This is not true for all insects, though. Insects that make a sound, like crickets and grasshoppers and so on, they have ears, so they are playing for someone, otherwise it would be fairly pointless. So some insects have ears, but not beetles. We give them a cap so they can't see the sky anymore. And then we kind of subject them to the same test as we did with, with me and Basil, the guy you saw before. And they, as you see, cannot roll straight either. This is because the compass they carry starts in the eyes. And it reads information from the sky. And here we have now, with the cap, stopped that information from being able to from being accessible to these animals and thereby they never they don't i mean this board is only 50 centimeters across and it takes them forever to roll away from the center so we really create chaos in dung beetle country if we give them a cap 
This is not because the Beatles can't wear a cap. That is actually perfectly fine, because we can give them transparent caps, and they will happily roll straight then. When they can no longer see the sky, though, they lose all their compass cues. The Beatles are fantastic in that they can use so many cues in the sky. During the day, they will use the sun, they will use the polarization pattern, I will get back to that, what that is. They can also use a spectral gradient and intensity gradient because if the sun is over here, the sky will be brighter there compared to over there, which gives them some information about where they're going. There will also be different colors in the sky that we are not really perceptive to, but if you look carefully, you will see a color chain difference in the sky. And then at night, of course, you have many, many beautiful nocturnal dung beetles. So these restaurants are kind of open 24-7. You have day active beetles and night active beetles and so on. And the night active beetles also have to navigate. They use the moon, spectral gradients, intensity gradients, but of course there are also stars. So how do you demonstrate what that these animals can use these cues? Well, I wanted to show you how we demonstrate that they can use the sun, for example, because this is the most beautiful illustration of, of the, the use of a compass cue. If we, for example, imagine that you over there are the sun, and I'm a dung beetle, then I can move straight by just keeping the sun on my left side all the time, and I will move in a straight line. But then, if we put a researcher, like me, over here and reflect the sun from the other direction. So the beetle starts keeping sun on its left, and all of a sudden now, the sun is on the right side. In my compass system, it tells me, oh, I'm 180 degrees, of course. So I need to rotate, get the sun back on my left, and I think I'm moving in a straight line. This is what that looks like for a beetle. Can you press the arrow and see if it goes forward? <coughs> yeah, okay. You see the beetle here now moving to your right. And then we mirror the sun and it moves to its left. Take the sun away and it turns again. We can keep on doing this for as long as we think it's fruitful for what we want to do. <laughs> because from the perspective of the beetle, might be having a fairly rough day, <laughs> but it thinks it's moving in a straight line. Okay. So a sun compass is used not only by these animals, but also by ants and bees and so on. It's a fairly common type of compass in the animal kingdom, so to say. Ah, now we're out of tune. Yep. No, don't, don't, yeah. Okay, excuse me. <coughs> I'm also out of tune. <laughs> Let it be night. So at night, there is, of course, a full moon. Be beetles can use this just as a sun. But around the sun and the moon is also a pattern of polarized light. It, having a vision, an ability to see polarized light, basically means you can see the difference if light is vibrating in this direction or if this light is vibrating in this direction. This is something we fully ignore because we cannot see the difference between these two states of light. And dung beetle can, and so can many other insects as well. And light, polarized light, is formed in circles around the sun or the moon. Is we can, in an easy way, think about it like a circular pattern around the sun or the moon. And it doesn't really matter now if the moon is hidden by a cloud because this pattern will still be there in the sky and the animals can use it for their navigation. The dung beetles, the South African dung beetles, are the only animals in the world that are known to be able to use these light patterns around the moon. 
We've shown this 10 years ago, and still we have not found any other animal that shares this ability with your beetles. <coughs> so what about when there is no moon? Well, there will be stars, and in the southern part of the, of the world, we have a beautiful Milky Way as well in the sky. Theoretically, we don't think that insects can see stars. Their eyes are just too small to perceive the little stars in the sky. Even so, when we did our experiments out in the field, everything pointed towards that the beetles were able to hold a straight course under the stars. We did not think that what we saw was true. We returned the next year, we tested them again, and still they were able to use the stars. So now we had to start to think, how can an animal use something they can't really see? To answer this, we moved into the Johannesburg Planetarium. And here you see my wonderful colleague Marcus Byrne as well, holding a beetle. And we worked in the, in the planetarium for several nights. We were only allowed to work at night because they had shows during the day. With a slight little scent of cow dung, I think, during the week we were there. Because we were there all night rolling beetles in the planetarium. And what we came to was that, no, the beetles cannot see stars. But they navigate using the Milky Way. The Milky Way is this streak of light that runs across the sky. And if you don't, it doesn't matter if you can see the stars, you can still see the streak of light. And that is what they navigate to. They can roll parallel to the Milky Way. They can roll 90 degrees to the Milky Way. It helps them to hold the course. And as of today, these beetles are the only animals in the animal kingdom that can navigate using the Milky Way. <coughs> so how does the biological compass work? What happens with the information? Well, it starts in the eyes. The little pink bits you see, maybe it's not so pink here, here, are the top eyes of the beetles. And if we rotate the head of the beetle, they will even have two eyes on the underside. So the, in the beetles have four eyes rather than two. And it's in the blue bit that they see the polarized light. And then in the rest of the eye, they see the stars and they see the moon and the sun and so on. So this is where all the information is collected. Then it goes into the brain of the insect. Remember they have a, about a 27-hour brain. That's the little white matter you see there. We can take it out, and the brain contains, just like your brain, different areas that are concerned with different problems in the world. And in the very center of the brain is where we find the compass center. This is where all the information about for the compass is sent, and then a signal goes out to the animal where to move. Okay, maybe now, more and more of you, hopefully, will stop using doom when you come home tonight and not kill all the insects that you have in your house. <coughs> if you haven't reconsidered your view of insects, if you thought they were fairly negative creatures before, I'm now going to give you one last thing to think about. This is one of the animals we have recently started to work with. It's a beautiful little dung beetle. And in difference to the other beetles, it actually has a home. So the other beetles will take the dung ball, roll it away, and then dig down where they think it's suitable, consume the dung ball, and a few days later, they come up again and they fly somewhere else. They don't really have a stable home situation, but these ones do. They will come out of the little nest that you see here, and they kind of look around at their compass at play, then they run out, find antelope dung in a petri dish, <laughs> not <laughs> usually, and then they start heading back to their nest. They do it backwards though, which you might think is a bit funny. And this guy now is not just going straight, it's going straight in the correct direction towards its home. So its compass needs to know where it should go. And then, whoops, it goes back again, and can feed its young in the nest. <coughs> so, if we look at this, we have a nest, and then we have the feeder. 
We let them come out from the nest, burr, 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 and they look for food, find it, and then they go straight home. They don't backtrack themselves. And once they have found the food once, they know where this is, and then they are shuttling back and forth between the feeding station and the home. This is a really complex task, if you think about it. Because if this here is the nest, it goes out, and then it walks around randomly. Finally, it finds food over here. Now it has to know where is home from here. And the way they do that is that when they're out walking, they know with every footstep, it's like I'm walking in this direction, this far, I'm walking in this direction, that far, now I'm going here this far, and that far, and in this direction. And then here, they need to do some sort of calculation from all these different segments of their route to come up with my nest is over there. And they do this with high precision, and then they go home. This is a system called path integration. We can do it using calculators. The beetles can do it using only their 27-hour brain. So the way we test this, this is the best way. We let them come out of the nest. They walk over to the feeding station here. We then lift them up. So they can't measure this happening to themselves. So we move them over here. This is now not part of the calculation because they haven't moved it themselves. They come here and they go, okay, where is home? Okay, it is over here. Because they haven't understood the movement we have made for them if they use a path integrator. So the, here comes the beetle, whoops, being moved. And it runs home. And this is where it starts looking for its nest. So, it calculates it correctly, it's just that we messes up the system by moving it. But again, it has to know distance and direction to be able to do this. One thing that one could think they would be using is to recognizing home. People are incredibly, the way you navigate here is using landmarks. You know what that pub looks like, you know... I don't know what you have here, the billboard and uh, the broken car or whatever is around here. And that is the way you find the way to the pub. That is not what the beetles do. Because we can take them from here, this is where they live. We can then carry them over to a car park where there is nothing. They will accept this as, yeah, okay, I'm in the neighborhood, I'm close to my home. And... Even though it looks completely different, this is the type of information that is ignored by the beetle in locating its home. So here, we have done exactly that. I have moved the beetle from where it lives, then I move it over to the car park. The white bit is where we theoretically know that the nest should be, because we know which direction it is and how far it is. And we release the animal, and it goes, oh, oh, my home should be somewhere here because it knows the distance and the direction, and then it drops its pellet, because it's very inefficient to carry around a large piece of food when you're looking for your home. How did animals do this? That is a very good question, and that is what we are recently trying to understand. They probably use a compass similar to the ones we have seen in the ball rolling cousins, and how do they measure distance? Hmm, maybe they count their footsteps, or any other solution. But even if we don't understand how they do it, we know they're able to do it with their miniature brain. So <coughs> now I would like to ask you, how many here have reconsidered a view of insects after this talk? Unless you loved insects before, because then you can, of course, hold your hand down a few. Good. Then I have accomplished of actually changing the world a little bit because I personally reconsider my view of insects almost every day. Thank you so much for having me here.